of the 14th chapter this morning, but it's all pertinent to what's happening towards the middle of the chapter and even towards the end of the chapter, and we're not going to jump into the end part of it. We dealt kind of with the first part of it a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we talked about Jesus had been invited to come to a, a dinner at a Pharisee's house. It was a Sunday afternoon dinner. And when he got there, they set him at the table and right across from him, they set a man who was sick with a disease called dropsy. And it was a, just a disease that his body and his arms and his legs would swell up. They would retain water. And it was very obvious that this man was there in pain. And they put him right across from Jesus. Why? Because it was the Sabbath. And they knew that Jesus could not pass someone who was hurting. He had compassion on them. And so Jesus went through a process of asking them, could he heal on the Sabbath? And they didn't answer because they were trying to catch Jesus in a, in a problem. And so finally he, he did. He reached out and healed the man and the man was gone. And then Jesus began to teach. The, the Pharisees and the religious people got what they wanted. They, they put him in a corner and they got what they wanted. See, he's guilty. He's guilty of being compassionate. He's guilty of being good. He's guilty of being powerful that he can heal someone. He's guilty. He has broken our laws but yet he establishes his own laws, and they couldn't stand that. Now Jesus is in a position where he begins to just teach and begins to give good moral encouragement and, and help. And he says to the people there, if, if you have a banquet, and, and when you come and sit at that banquet, don't get all in the first tables, and don't get all the honored places, and thinking you're the honored guest. Because then when someone more important comes in, they'll move you to the back, and it's embarrassing for you to have to get up and move to the back. But sit in the back, sit in the less honorable places, and then let someone come and move you up to the front places. Because he was just saying to them, we should always live a humble life, and we should always do everything we can to be humble in those kind of situations. And I think that that's what he was trying to convey to these people. And now we jump into this next portion of Scripture, and, and I hit it a little bit three weeks ago, but I want to jump in here and we're going to spend our time this morning in, in verses 15 through 23. And I want you to look down here and let's begin to, to read these verses. And it, and it says this in verse number 15. When one of those men at the table heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, this is what Jesus replied. He uses a parable. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready. But they all alike, it says all of them, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought 10 yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, I cannot come. The servant came back and replied to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and alleys and towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house may be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste at my banquet. Now, interesting portion of story here, and I'm not going to take the time to, to jump back into other renditions of this, but in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, we won't, we won't jump in there just right now, but back in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, we see this same story take place, this same parable. And this is in the portion of Scripture in Matthew where Matthew talks about the parables that are the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like the kingdom of God is like. Matthew records it, and that may be that this, this man here in this scripture says, it will be great for us to eat at the kingdom uh, of God, eat, eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Maybe why he said that, and Luke just didn't re record those specific things. But here we see this, and when we look at the scripture back in Matthew, we, we understand who these characters were. Because in this scripture in Matthew, it talks about the king who is God. 
And it talks about he threw a banquet for his son, a marriage feast for his son, which is Jesus. And it was a wedding feast, which is a symbol of salvation or heaven. They're invited into that fellowship. They're invited into that union with Christ. And so when we see that and we compare that, lay that on top of this scripture, it makes a little bit more sense that what Jesus is telling us here is something that's more profound than just talking about a banquet and people being invited. He's talking about spiritual matters, and that's what we want to pull out of this. We want to understand what the spiritual value is this and what's being said. So there's three things that, that I've separated this thing out as, and let's look at them a little clearer and a little, little more directly. The first thing is this, is that there's an invitation to be accepted. There's an invitation to be accepted. If you'll see in, in Scripture here in verse 16 and 17, Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great table and invited many guests. He, a great banquet, I'm sorry, and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent out his servants to tell those who were invited, Come, for everything is ready. Now, let me just give you a little bit of explanation on this. I did it last time, and I want to clarify it for this time. What Jesus was basically doing in, in this culture, when they had a banquet or they had something like a marriage feast, it was a big deal. I mean, they spent lots of weeks and lots of days preparing for this. And just like they would today at weddings, they'll send out invitations, and they'll get RSVPs. Many times they would do it verbally. They would go and say, you're invited, you're invited, you're invited, can you come? And of course, you would say, well, yes, I would love to. I'm very honored. Thank you for asking me. Okay, we want to count on you. I'll be there. And so they mark it down so they can go back and they can say, we have 200 guests that have confirmed that are going to be. Now they can prepare to get everything ready for that. And the day of the banquet comes, they don't give them a time, but they know that it's going to be in the afternoon. They know that. And so instead of having the guests all come at a certain time, when the feast is ready and when everything is set, when the table is set, when the food is prepared, a time that, that no one knows, maybe the date or the hour, nobody knows this time, but you're prepared to go. And then he says, go, I want you to go out and tell the people it's time. Are you seeing the parallels here? I want you to go. We're ready. The banquet, the table is set. Everybody's in place. Go, tell them we're ready. And they go out and they begin to say, it's time. It's time. This, this, we send an invitation now this is the actual announcement. It's time for you to come. The banquet has been spread. The table is ready. It's time to come. And one by one, it says that most of these guests, well, it actually says here, it says, but they all alike. It says they all begin to make excuses. Now, obviously, this is a parable. Jesus is trying to make a point here. But people are having excuses. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. You know, there are, there are excuses and there's reasons, yeah. Right? There may be a reason that you can't do it, but you make an excuse to cover for the reason because you don't want to say the reason. The reason is I just don't want to go. I don't like hanging out with you, you know? You, I can't imagine spending an hour sitting talking to you. I had someone tell me one time, I have no interest in sitting and across the table and talking with, with people, and he was not referring to me, but he was referring to people like me. Sometimes people are just like that. that I, I appreciate you being honest, but most of the time we say, you know what? Oh, oh man, is that today? I forgot all about it. I'm, I, I'm, I haven't been feeling good. Or they give this stuff here. They, uh, I've, I've got a, a five yoke of oxen that I've got to go test out. Or I, I bought a new piece of property and I got to go check it out. You haven't seen it yet? You purchased it sight unseen? That's not very, you know, if that's the case, I got some swamp land in Louisiana I'd like to tell you about. You know, I got some prime real estate down there. But they make these excuses about why they can't come and and Jesus is trying to make the point here is that everybody's going to have an excuse, but the invitation is going to go out to everyone. There's going to be an invitation that's sent out. And although they received this invitation, they had to accept the invitation. Just receiving it wasn't enough, but you actually have to accept it. Receiving it is verbal. Accepting it is physical. You have to step into that, and you have to move into what God is asking you to do. Now, I love the scripture in 1 Corinthians 1.9. It said, God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, and, and, and Savior, and, and, and our Lord, is faithful. In other words, the invitation has been sent to you. All of us have been invited. All of us have been a part of this. He says, come. It's time. 
We want you to know the invitation has been sent out to every one of us. We're here this morning because God has invited us to be part of his fellowship. And many of us are here this morning because we're physically stepping out to accept that invitation. We say we want to be a part of this. We've shown that with our lives, with the preparation, with coming, with our hearts prepared. We've come to do that. So let me ask you this. Who is being invited to this? Well, realistically, probably in this day and age, what Jesus is talking about is Israel. He's giving the invitation out to all of Israel. Israel, we want you to come. Israel has had this relationship with God that's been up and down. It's been disappointing, right? God invites Israel. Israel responds, and then sometimes it rejects God. We see the things that are happening in Israel today, and we think, why in the world is this stuff happening? Because Israel, in a lot of ways, have rejected God. The Israel that we knew in the past is the same Israel that's today, But you saw in the Old Testament how they rejected God, and then God brought them back, and they rejected God, and God brought them back. We are a facsimile of what Israel is, but I know that God's blessing is still available to Israel, even though Israel does not follow them. I don't know if you guys saw the video, but I had it sent to me of of some kind of political figure, congressman, or something that was in a parliament room in Turkey and he was a Muslim man, and he was talking about Israel, and he actually, there on the floor of their Senate, everybody's dressed up, and it looks like a Congress type room, he, he sent a curse out on Israel. He cursed Israel, and he cursed who they were, and he sent a curse upon them, a verbal curse upon them. Well, we know that Scripture says if you curse Israel, you know, the Lord will take you out. And when that man finished, before he finished his speech, he turned and fell down and had a heart attack right there. You, you can see it on the video. If you guys look it up, you'll find it. And it is absolutely the truth. And I thought, okay, is this really real? And so I, I texted uh, Amy Flattery, who was here and talked with us, and she's an expert in Israel policy and stuff. She said, that actually happened. Yes, it did happen. There was a man who got up and cursed Israel, and God took him out right there on television in front of everybody. He is, God don't play, all right? God don't play. But God has given every one of us this invitation to say, we, I want you to come. You were invited to be a part of this. It, whether this is talking about salvation or if it's talking about church, of course, me as a pastor, I see this as church. But this invitation is, is an invitation for you to come. It's an invitation for us to come to be a part of what God has for us. The invitation is verbal. But the announcement is physical, or the actual process is physical. We have to actually come and physically do what God is asking us to do. So how does this happen? Is this talking about church attendance? I I see it as talking about church attendance because when I ever have people making excuses, it's always to come to church, right? I can't come, I'm busy, I work, I've got to, you know, I've got to wash my hair, I've got to, whatever excuses people have, that's fine. The real reason is that maybe they don't see value in it or they think that they don't have to do all that stuff or I can just watch online, we're thankful for you to watch online. But there's something different about being in God's presence when you're here. And what God is saying to us is this, He uses it here in this inference to say, listen, I want you to come and be a part of this fellowship. I want you to come and be a part of this banquet table that I've spread for you. It's food for you to eat. And if we take that into a spiritual sense, we see that the food for us to eat is what we prepare for you guys every week. It's the word of God. It's the nourishment that you get from God. You can't live a Christian life on your own without spiritual food. It is impossible. Oh, you can do it for a little while. We can live without food for a little while too. But after a while, you can be faking it all you want. But if you don't eat, pretty soon you're going to fall over dead because you don't have the nourishment. Same thing spiritually. We can look spiritual. We can dress spiritual. We can talk spiritual. We can even act spiritual. But if you're not getting the food that comes from the living word of God and spending time digesting and putting this word in your heart, you will die spiritually you will die spiritually. Don't prove me. Don't, don't prove that I'm right. Please don't. Don't say, well, I'm going I'm to prove him wrong. Well, no, you won't. Don't try it. Listen to, listen to this old guy up here with the gray hair. We've already gone through these processes. I can tell you many times that God wants you to grow spiritually. And those people who think they can buck the odds and go against it, 
it just absolutely will not work. You have to be a part of what God has for you. So this morning I realized that I'm preaching to the choir, but you know what? That's the thing. God is inviting all of us so that we all have this invitation. We understand that, okay? Number two is this. There's a mission to be accomplished. I want you to look here at verses number 21 through 23. And it says, the servants came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and alleys in the towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, and the blind. Sir, he said, sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servants, go out into the roads and the country lanes and make them come in, or, or some versions say compel them to come in so that my house may be full. So there was one invitation that was already given. Now here's another invitation that's given. And he says, I want you to go out and I want you to not just go to the house of Israel, but now I want you to go to the Gentiles. If Israel's not gonna listen, if Israel's not gonna hear my voice, if Israel's not interested in coming and spending time with me, then I'm gonna go to the Gentiles. I'm gonna go to the people who I did not specifically come for and I didn't really put the invitation out for them. Now I'm changing that to, to, to the outskirts. I'm changing that to other people. I'm changing that to other places. I'm changing that to, to these people who are, are away from me. Those people who, who need to hear. Those people who I know are, I, I, want to be them, I want them to be a part of what's happening in service this morning. Listen, you guys, here's the thing. It's so important for us to understand this, that God does not want to take his presence from us. He doesn't want to, we, you know, we live in this culture, and, and I know it's even hard sometimes to say that, that America is, you know, blessed by God. We, we have, in God we trust over the things we do. We believe that we are a Christian nation, but slowly that's not becoming the reality, Slowly, our government is more and more trying to rule God out. In my opinion, most of the things that we see today in, in the world, most of the issues we have with, with gender issues, with sexual issues, with, with abortion issues, with moral issues, they stem back from religious principles that the government doesn't want to say we defend. The, the other side who's opposing them doesn't want to say that we don't respect those things. And so they make up their own laws. But the thing is that it all comes back to religious and moral issues that we have that we find in the spiritual and the word of God. God has a way established for us to live. And if we choose not to live that way, then we have to reap the consequences of that. And I'm afraid America is in that place. We are not the nation that's chosen by God. We are Christians and God loves us and we are chosen by him. But America is not the Christian nation that we used to be. The things that we found Founded upon were Christian principles. Most of those Christian principles either are not here today or they're being fought away. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus still makes a way for us. He still has provided a way for us to come to his table and to spend time with him and to learn and to feed from what God has for us. He is a gracious God. I, in, in dealing with this scripture, especially this part, when we get into this portion of saying, what's Jesus' heart for the world? This is something I wrestle with, all right? I'm just going to be honest with you. I wrestle with this. And I've wrestled with it, and some of you I've verbally wrestled with it, and you know I've, I've talked to you about it, and I've, I, I, I've witnessed to you about it. I have this image, and just hang with me here just a second. I have this image of the 1950s and 1960s church, I have this image in my head. I have this image of mom and dad, they get up in the morning and they have breakfast. They get the kids ready and they're all in their nice dresses and the boys are in suits and ties and they all get dressed up and they all come in their four-door sedan and come to the church and they go to their classes and they come into service and they all sit together and they, they have a great time and they go home and they have a lunch prepared, mom put a roast on and they all go home and they have this nice little lunch together and grandparents come over and they're, it's this nice little family unit that we see. That's my image of what the church should be. I, so I, I'm being honest. 
That's my image of what church should be. It should be these, these, these young, these families, these nice looking families that everybody's dressed up and everybody comes together. That's our image of what we have church is. Where did we get that image? We don't see it in the Bible. I got that image, I guess, from Hallmark movies. I don't know where I got the image from. I got the image from, you know, Life Magazine or, or Good Housekeeping. I don't know where I got it. But that's the image that we have in our heads. And we always want to create this, this family atmosphere, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when I come back and when I look at Jesus' ministry, I don't look at, I don't see Jesus trying to pull together family units so they can sit together and go home and eat together. I don't see that. If, if it's there, please point it out to me because I don't see it. But here's where I see Jesus. This is what I see Jesus' mission is. I'm gonna jump back to Matthew, the first cha- or Matthew the 11th chapter, and this is on the screen so you can see it. In Matthew the 11th chapter, John the Baptist sent some of his disciples to go see Jesus because John is in prison, and just frankly, he's probably just tired of being in prison, you know? And he's like, hey, is Jesus, I mean, I prophesied that Jesus was the Messiah and all this kind of stuff, but... If, he's good, if he is, then let's get this show on the road because I'm tired of living in prison. You know what I'm saying? If we're going to conquer something, let's get it going. That seems to fit John the Baptist's personality. And so here in, in Matthew, the 11th chapter, he sent his, he sent his disciples to Jesus. And here, here, here's what it says, in, starting in verse number two. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his, his disciples to ask him, are you the one who has come or should I expect someone else? So he's just saying, if you're the one, let's get this thing going because I'm getting tired of this. And here's Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you have heard and seen. Listen to this. The blind receive the sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And blessed is he who does not stumble on my account. You know, I think it's interesting that he doesn't say, go back and report to him that the families are coming to church in in groups of four and five by great numbers. Moms and dads and kids are back together. The affluent is being lifted up and accelerated and they're buying new homes and they're buying new cars and everybody is happy. He doesn't say that, but he goes to the reason that he came and that was to heal to free, to set free, to deliver, to help the people who are in the world because they come with real needs. That's what he's coming to minister to. And that's when we look at the person of Jesus, that's who we see Jesus doing. That's what we see Jesus doing. Everywhere we look in scripture, this is what we see. Do you see that in the gospels? Do you hear that in Jesus's voice? He's always reaching the lowest. He's always reaching the hurting. When he comes to the world, he doesn't come in a palace. He comes in a manger. He comes around shepherds and servants and people because he starts at the bottom and works his way up. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, it's not poured out among kings and princes and and, and the the religious order, but he pours it out to a, a group of 120 believers who are hidden away in a room because they're afraid of what could happen to them. He starts it there and it comes from the bottom. When finally the Holy Spirit is kind of released and and put here in in, in the U.S. and in the world, he doesn't start it in the White House or in the big churches in New York City, but he starts it in a small livery stable in California to minorities and poor people, and he pours out his Holy Spirit in a revival that started in Azusa Street so that we begin to grow and expand. Why is that? Because if it had started at the top, they would have figured out a way to keep it from going to the bottom. But when he starts at the bottom, it's grassroots. You can't do anything about that. It begins to flourish and grow. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is for the least and the lost. Jesus is, that's who he is. I, I put this Up on the screen, you cannot see Jesus in Scripture without him having compassion for people. That's the image that we always have of Jesus. And that's the image that I want to convey to you guys. Our church is not about just getting pretty people in the church. Our church is not just about getting rich people or getting people that are young or getting people that are anything. 
Our job in the church is to reach the lost. And if the affluent don't want to come and fill these seats, then let's go and find people who do, who are hungry, because Jesus, we're wasting food up here. We're wasting time and energy up here. We're not running out of money, folks. We're running out of time. Jesus is coming back, and we need to fill these auditorium and these seats with people because there are people in this church, in this town, that need to know who Jesus is. There's people in this town that need to see a real example of Jesus Christ, and he has made you his missionary to go into the world to love the lost so that they can come to Christ. What are we doing, and how are we going to account for that? Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? I, I, want you, I, I, I want you to help me. Uh, um, Cody, come up here. I mean, um, uh, Brody, come up here. I need, I need three chairs. Come, come give me three chairs. It'll make two of you. You can't do them all by yourself. You may have to bring someone with you. Bring three chairs. I need three chairs. Go. One at the end. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Can you, there, there you go. One, one there. One there. One there. One there. Thank you, bro. Thank you, guys. Yeah. No, that's all right. You, if, it, it, it lifts. The other one. Help him out. Help him out. He's new. Help him out. There you go. We got it. Three chairs. Right here. Put it down here on this end. These three chairs represent something. Here's the table of the Lord. These three chairs up here this morning represent something very important. This first chair down here on the end, I'm not going to get out of the lights because they won't be able to see me online. This chair down here at the end, this is the host. This is the host. This is the one who puts the banquet on. That's the honored seat. Nothing, if this seat isn't here, nothing else matters, all right? He's the host. He's the one that, that put the banquet on, that provided for it. He's the one that brings the food. He, that's his spot down there. He, he's the host of glory. He's, that's Jesus. That's God, whoever you want to say. That's the one down there that's the important one. That's the place of honor. The, this, this seat right here is, is the one who we're invited to be a part of. We as the church, we're invited. He's inviting us to come. In fact, he's inviting us to take both of these seats. But the fact is, is that only one of them is taken. Because you guys are here today. This is your seat. This is where you sit. You have a seat at the table because God invites you to come and be a part of this place. And you come faithfully. Some of you guys have been here almost, you're, you're hardly ever, you hardly ever miss. You're always here. And I'm not completely sure why, but I, I, know, I know it's because, number one, you want to be faithful. Number two, you have missions and you have a job here and that's what you want. But number three, there's something that draws you to this place. You want to be a part of this. And I'm kind of like that. I ask myself, would you go to church somewhere if you weren't pastoring? Absolutely, I would, because I believe it to my core. I want to be around God's people. And that's important for me. This chair is the chair that I think is important. This chair is the empty chair. This chair is the one that nobody's sitting in. And all this food has been prepared. I didn't pour food out here, but all this food has been set out and prepared for us, and there's plenty. We can't eat all of it. There's food on the table to be shared by whoever. And, and, and when several people have said, ah, I can't make it, ah, I don't really want to do it, I'd rather go to, you know, quick tip and get a taquito, I'm in a hurry, I got things to do, I just got married, I just got a new this, I just got a new that, my business is, but I can't do it, that's fine, I understand some people, they look at God and they just say, you know what, I'm just not feeling it at this point in my life. There's just something else out there. There's something better. There's something I don't, I, don't want. I don't want the God my parents had. I don't want the God that I see on television. I don't want that God. And that's fine. I, I understand those kind of things. But the thing is, is that we're not looking for a religious system. We're not looking to copy somebody else. We just want to be close to Jesus and let him transform you to be who he wants you to be. This is an original thing. You don't have to copy anybody. But the plea has been set out. The mission has been set out for us to fill this chair up. And so what we do is that we have people, and I'll use Kevin Coates as an example. We have people like Kevin Coates who come into the church and because of just the passion they have in their lives, they begin to go out and invite people to come. He goes out and invites people to come. I gotta tell him sometimes, Kevin, listen, quit bringing so many people. We can't handle all of it, all right? It's, there's so much to it. We've gotta structure this thing a little bit better. I wish I could tell you guys to quit asking people to come. 
Don't point your finger at somebody else and say, I wish he wouldn't be doing that. I wish he, why don't you get on the pastor's side where the pastor's got to say, would you quit bringing people? We can't handle all the people that you bring. Our parking lot's full. We're going to have to get a new van to shuttle people over. I'm going to have to get new chairs. I don't want you to do it. No, I want you to do that. I want whoever wants to come to this church come. Now, we have to have some rules. We have to have some order. There's got to be some stuff. And every part of me says, listen, we want to be this structured thing. We don't want messy stuff in here. And then I go to Scripture, and I see the Scripture saying, no, no, go out into the highways and byways and ask the Gentiles, ask the, the people who aren't saved to come in. Well, we've already done that. We still have empty seats. Okay, then go out into the countryside and beg them to come in. The word compel means make them, almost forcefully put, put their arm behind their back, make Go out and ask them, beg them, tell them, come. Why? Because the food's been set. The table is ready to go. Their lives can be changed. Don't come to hear a pastor. Don't come to hear a singer. Don't come to get donuts and coffee. Come to meet Jesus because he's the only one that can change you. And this seat is available. This seat is open. You can look around. The Tulsa metropolitan area has almost 800,000 people who live in the Tulsa metro area. And this is all we can draw? I think God wants more from us. I think he wants compassion from us. I think he wants to reach the people. The only difference is that we sometimes aren't brave enough to reach out and tell another person this beggar telling another beggar where they found food. If Christ changes me, if he transforms my life, I can't wait to bust out of here and go tell people, guess what happened to me today? I used to be an alcoholic and God changed my life and now my kids are winning state championships. Gideon, beast mode. State champion, 11-year-old state champion in powerlifting right here. Stand up, stand up. There he is. There he is. And I love seeing him on the podium because everybody on the podium is down for, remember, big tall guys. And here he is up there standing. And the boy's cut. I mean, he, you don't lift that just by accident. He's, he's, he's pretty cut. Lizzie, you need to watch out. He might, he might pound you. But here's the thing, God, or here's the thing, you guys. Once we fill this chair, I need another chair. Kivy, give me that other chair. Come on, give me another chair. Once we feel that chair, come on, wrestle with it. Wrestle with it. It's worth it. You can do it. All right. Come on, put it right here. Once we have that chair filled, let's get another chair. Here's where Jesus is. Jesus' heart. Here's, here, here's where Jesus is. Jesus' heart that we have the table set and that we have the chairs provided so that people can come meet Jesus Christ. That's what our job is. Are you with me? I'll never forget a young man back when I was a youth pastor when my dad hired me to be youth pastor in our church and I had no idea what I was doing. I really didn't know what I was doing. I was completely lost. I had about three sermons and that's all I had and that couldn't last me very long. But I made a goal and I said, my goal is I want to have 100% of the young people who attend this church to be a part of our youth group. And when we started the youth group, or when I came there as youth pastor, we had about 25 or 30 kids in the group. And in about a month, by, well, a few months, I, I got hired in January 1st. And by the summer when camp started, the group had dwindled down to seven kids. I lost all my leaders. I lost a lot of the kids in the church. It dwindled down to seven kids. And I decided I, my first goal is to reach every kid that's in this church. And Someone said, hey, do you know Greg? And I won't mention his last name. And I said, no. Well, he's someone's brother, and he comes, his parents come, and he comes every Sunday. I had no idea. I've known this family for years. I didn't know. They had adopted a boy when he was young, and he had grown up, but he wasn't a part of church. He sat on the back row by himself. He left before church was over, went out and sat out in the car. He would sit out in the car and then come late, and his parents let him do that. They actually had moved him to a shed in the back of the house instead of in the house. He was in a shed outside, and that's where he lived out there. This kid was tough. He was hard. He was into drugs and crazy living and all that kind of stuff. I didn't even know who he was. And I said, I'm going to meet him. 
Well, I'm the guy on the keyboards after service. I'd always play in service and close the service, and I got someone else to do that. And I'd go out the side door, and I'd go back to where his, their car was, and I'd stand there and wait on him, and he would come out, and I would finally met him and said hi to him. And I did that for three or four Sundays. And finally, he says, why are you doing this? And I said, because I want to get to know you, because I want you to know that I care about you and that God cares about you. He didn't say nothing, got in the car. But I kept doing that. I'd go and take him out to lunch. I would reach out to him. I kept inviting him to come to youth service. Finally, he came to youth service. I asked him to go on a retreat with us. He came on the retreat. He sit on the back row, act like he was sleeping the whole time. He wasn't. He wasn't. He was listening. And as time went by, Jesus was able to break through Greg's life, and he gave his heart to the Lord. And I'll never forget the retreat that we were at when Greg came down to the front when we had an altar call at the end of the retreat, and the place went crazy. And I got close to him. I said, do you hear that? They're all clapping because they're proud of you. He's got big tears running down his face, and God saved him. Why is that? It's because God wants to save the least and the lost. He wants to save your kids. He wants to save your family. Don't bring them to church because I'm a great preacher. Thank you for those amens. Don't bring them to church because Sandy's a great singer. Don't bring them to church because we got great coffee. Bring them to church because we serve a great God and give God a chance to transform their lives. Last. Last. Don't even look at the clock. Just listen. The last one is there's a warning to be heeded. There's a warning to be heeded. Don't be the one that God chooses to pass by. Look at this verse number 24. This, this verse haunts me. I've prayed about this and thought about this for a long time. Last time I spoke on this, I talked about it too. Look what verse number 24 says. I tell you, not one of those men who are invited will, taste, will get a taste of my banquet. Of, of my banquet? That's what Jesus said. Jesus is the one who's saying this parable. Now, at the very end of this, he jumps out of this parable character and he begins to talk on his own. I'll tell you the truth, that not one of these men will be invited to taste at my, at, my, at my banquet. Jesus now is taking this personal. He's saying, these people who have rejected me, these people who have chosen not to be here, these people who have gone their own way and done their own thing, I promise you this, because they've chosen not to be a part of this, they won't have a seat at my table. My table is talking about heaven. My table is talking about what God has for me. And what he's saying here is that it is possible for him to withdraw his presence, his invitation from us. Not that he doesn't want us to come, but because we have rejected him. How do we know that we've rejected him? When the light of God does not live in your life anymore, you've rejected him. How do I know if that happens? When you desire the things of the world more than you desire the things of God, the light of God is not inside of you. When I get more pleasure in doing the things of the world, when I get more pleasure in fulfilling my own desires than I get in spending time in his presence and witnessing to someone and seeing a life changed, maybe God's not in you. Maybe you're doing this out of habit. Psalms 51, 11, when, when David went through his situation with Bathsheba and that he was caught in his sin, he comes back and Psalms 51 is his pleading of, of forgiveness. And he says this, and this, this, this scares me, this verse scares me. 51, 11, it says this, do not cast me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You mean that's possible? I thought he was a God of love and he accepted everything and everybody is invited. Every, we are, but if we reject him, he keeps the invitation there, but he puts his efforts into the chairs that are empty and he starts reaching those people. You can still come back if you want to, but his emphasis is not, his energy is not towards you. His energy is on the lost and the least of this church and of the people of this community. What does that say to me? That says to me, that I have to make sure that I choose him. I've got to make sure that I step into what he has for us. I got to make sure that I reach out and invite people in. I got to make sure that I'm here part of his presence and I'm growing spiritually. I'm reading my Bible. I'm spending time with him. That's what God is asking us to do. 
We're not going to fill the church with these cute little families where everybody's dressed up and they never get dirty and they never say a bad word and never do a bad thing. Those people don't exist. What God wants is for us to reach his children. He wants us to reach the least and the lost. And if we can't fill it up with the affluent or with the people who got it all together, then let's go reach the ones who are crippled and hurt and broken and homeless and begging and need somebody's help. Let's go to those people and let's love them. Why? Because Jesus is there. Jesus is there. Jesus is there. You guys, this is something I've been grappling with in my own life for a long time. And everything inside of me wants to see that church, that that's cute little families that come, and everything's just perfect in their lives. But I don't think Jesus is in that. And that's the way some churches are. Some churches, they organize, that's what they do. They're, they only set up churches in, in suburbs. They only set up churches in little cute affluent areas. They don't do ministry downtown. They don't do ministry on the north side. They don't reach uh, the homeless. They don't do nightlight. They don't do uh, the bridge ministry. They don't do those kind of things. They just want to keep to them themselves. And that's fine. If they're called to do that, that's great. I just want to do what Jesus calls us to do. And I don't want Jesus to decide he's done with us and he's out. I don't want that. I want that for you, and I don't want that. I don't want that for me. I'll tell you guys a story. If you've grown up in the church, this may make sense to you. For some, it may not. But I can remember as a young boy, Dad was always my pastor. Um, he was always my preacher. And I say, I, I hate to say this. I don't remember. Any, I only remember one of his messages. And it was usually probably because I was talking or cutting up or whatever. But. I remember being in the service one time. We were in Sepulpa, in the, old, in the old building in Sepulpa. It was an old Methodist building, and I was probably nine, seven, eight, nine. I don't remember how old I was. I was old enough to know better, but too young to, to resist, right? But I remember being in a service, and we had a great time of, of worship and praise, and we were worshiping God and just have a great revival type kind of thing. And mom was up at the organ, and and Janice, whoever her name was on the piano, wasn't it? No? Trula Basing? I can't remember who was on the piano. But mom was on the organ, and my mom was always super close to the Lord, and always, if the Lord was in the room, she, it, it, you could see it on her. She was like the, the barometer. And mom was playing, and I remember her, her praying, and, and we were all worshiping and praying. And I remember mom's praying became louder and louder, and her cries becoming more and more and more pronounced. And I remember right in the middle of the worship, Mom, stop playing. And she started crying. And she started saying, no, don't go. No, don't go. In this low kind of crying voice that I've only heard from her a couple of times. But she said, no, don't go. And the, in, where the organ was, there was a door that the choir would come out and go up on stage. And she was going towards that door crying, no, don't go. And she came back, interrupted service, and she said, the Holy Spirit said that he's leaving. If we won't worship and if we won't obey and if we won't follow him, he's leaving. And I remember as a young boy, the traumatic event of that, talk about crisis moments, that was a crisis moment. But the thought had never occurred to me that Jesus would say, I'm out, I'm out. But here's the thing, Jesus wants more than anything else for this congregation and for you as the people of God. Yes, he wants you whole. Yes, he wants you healed. But his last words to Peter after all they'd been through is, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Then reach the people that I need. Reach the lost. Reach the broken. Reach the friends and people that you know in your life. Reach those people. Go get those people. Those are the people that I came and died for. We come to church and we sit and we, we're looking for something different. And is the pastor going to preach good or short today? Is the music going to be good? That's not what matters. What matters is 
did you have people that you have brought into this church so that they can meet the living God of the universe? Because if all of us come with needs, they're going to get met. But what God's heart is, is to reach the people on the outside to fill the chairs that need to be filled. That's what our mission is. That's what our mission as people are. That's what our mission as pastors are. That's who we are. Because Jesus loves them, but he chooses to use people like us to go. I guess the king or the master could have said, that's it. I'm going out to every one of those people and dragging them in myself. He didn't. He said, I want you to go. He gave them a mission. Go out, compel them, beg them, ask them to come in to be a part of this church, to be a part of the fellowship, to be a part of the goodness of God. That's what God wants for us this morning. You guys... I hope you hear my heart in this thing. This has been something I've struggled with. But I want you to hear my heart in this. Sink or swim. Sink or swim. God's brought the people into this church that he wants to be here to provide the ministries that he wants us to do. Now we have to open up our eyes and get out of our seats and we got to go and make a difference in the world. Amen. Are you with me? Are you, do you hear my heart this morning? Do you hear my heart this morning? Then stand with me, would you please? No, I don't want you to. Sit down, just a second. Again, this is my, this is my growing, this is my bringing up. I, I don't want to do just a dismissal prayer and say, everybody go. God bless you and I'll hug your neck on the way out. I want to ask you this if you believe that if you believe that and if you'll say Jesus I want to follow you give me the people put me around the right people I want to be a part of this mission I want to be a part of your mission to the world then if that's you I want you to stand You don't have to if you don't. But you're standing because you say, this is my mission. This is what I want to do. I see this in the scripture. Every time we saw Jesus, he didn't go to the palace and talk to the the high people there. He didn't go to the government officials. He didn't go into the church and say, get all the Sanhedrin around me. I'm going to tell them how things are. He didn't do that. Jesus went. Jesus went to the alleys. He, he went to the, the well outside of town. He, he went to the, the pool of Bethesda where the sick people were. He went and found Zacchaeus up in a tree because he couldn't. He went around the back and got to the people who were in the back who couldn't see. Jesus was always reaching the least and the lost. That's where his heart was. He came as the Messiah. That's what he came to do. Let's take that on and let's go reach the least and the lost. Let's take that on. Lord Jesus... God, my prayer this morning has been that you let me speak your words and you let me do your bidding this morning. God, I hope I've conveyed that to these people that we love. But Father, the thing that matters in this world and it matters to me is that we reach people who are far from you. This church doesn't exist just to pay people and to to go through the motions every week and every Sunday. But Lord, this church exists to reach the people who are far from you so that they can know who you are. And Father, I pray that you would help us to do that and do it in the way that you want us to do it. Lord, we we want to be your hand extended to the world. We want to be your people. But Lord, your people have to go do your bidding. And so, Lord, I just pray that in these next couple of weeks, well, we have Easter coming up. Lord, my prayer is that every... every seat would be full. That every person in here would invite family and friends. They would go through their their, their contacts in, in Instagram and Facebook and they would send those invites to everybody in the area that they know. Even the people who used to go here but don't anymore. Even the people who, who have moved away or, or family and friends. They may attend other churches. I don't know. But Lord, we're just going to send it to everybody we know and then we're going to invite them and ask them to come. And this Easter is going to be a mission service for people who are far from God. And Lord, we want to invite them in so they can experience you. 
That's the mission of this church. And Father, I pray that you would put this boldness inside of us. As a church staff, give us the direction and give us the creativity to provide those things for this congregation and be ready for when those people come. But Lord, it's up to them to take the mission that you've asked them to do and to go to the world to make a difference. I ask this in Christ's awesome name. Amen. 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 You guys, let, let's, let's go. Let's go and make a difference in this world, all right? Yes, we have announcements that we didn't do this morning, and I'll try to do some of them. We'll, we'll post them on Facebook, and you can look at them there. But just remember, coming up in two weeks is Easter, Easter Sunday, okay? I don't care if you buy something new or if you got a new suit on or new clothes. I don't care. All I care about is that you bring somebody with you. Bring somebody with you. Now, listen. That morning, we're almost at capacity with our parking right now. So we will be shuttling people across from the streets. So for our regular folks, when you come, would you just go over to the, the parking lot right across the street from us here, Integris. Park over there. There'll be a van. You'll see our van. Van will pick you up and bring you over. Don't cross the street by yourself, and then we'll take you back at the end of service. But if you'll do that, then that will allow the parking spots around our church to be open to our guests. All right? Is that, is that good? Will you guys do that with me? All right. Invite somebody. Love you guys. Bless you. Sorry we didn't get announcements, but I want you guys to go. Have a great Sunday in the name of the Lord. Thank you guys for being here. We love you.